my personal experience led me to understand that there are those substances that can help, but also that they're not just the only thing that helps. But if you combine work and psychedelics, then you can be quite successful to get out of trauma and uh, depression and PTSD or whatever you're suffering, addictions of personal people. Recently, it's such a popular subject. And I think like our duty is to not just sugarcoat them and make them like, yeah, they're going to save the world, but actually show the balanced conversation around benefits and harms that psychedelics can bring to us. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Psychedelic Conversations podcast. So thrilled to be having you here, as well as my guest, Anya Olekshuk. She is the presenter, filmmaker, and also the co-director of Psychedelic uh, Society UK. So thrilled to have you. Thank you so much for joining me. Hi, Susan. Thanks for having me. So as you know, traditionally, we love talking about your story. Um, just to give a context to our listeners also, is it okay for you to share some of your story? How did you come into the medicine work? How did you come into the, the things that you do right now? Yeah, I tried psychedelics very early in my life. I was only 18. I um, was lucky enough to have older friends who knew more than me. And uh, quite immediately I knew that all the propaganda we heard in school and from TV, like as it will make you jump out of the window, that this is pretty much exaggerated. You know, I, I grew up thinking that LSD is worse than heroin and it's like the worst thing in your life, but then tried it and felt um, really surprised that actually, no, it's quite a nice substance that like to connect with yourself and nature. But, um, you know, I didn't make much of it back then. I did psychedelics a few times in my life, mushrooms, forest in the forest, or a um, little LSD or something, but nothing serious. And then I suppose as I got older and, uh, you know, life brought challenges and, and, and things, I, I started feeling really depressed. I started figuring out I actually have depression. I had it for years, but it was like, kind of creeping creeping up on me and at some point I was in such state that I would just like go to work have wine with my friends and spend time on social media or playing games or just whatever I could do to not think about how I'm feeling and it was to a point I was really miserable and uh, therapy didn't work and yoga worked to a certain degree and meditation but not that much and then I reminded myself the the psychedelics, the first trip I had with my friends. And I thought, I just want to feel like that again. You know, I want to feel happy again, just even if it's just for a few hours. So me and my friend Hanya, we uh, we took this type of acid and it was 200 micrograms. Much I didn't know anything about dosing. I just probably before did maybe 50 or 70 micrograms. So it was quite a shock because we went to the park and we thought we were just going to walk and see the trees. But what happened was like one of the most profound experiences of experiences of my life. Um, I just saw my body travel, my, my soul, my body, I don't know what it was, traveling through the history of the world and understanding so many things that happened. And then understanding my life and uh, that I'm not my depression and actually connecting to nature, all of it, all of it, all the mystical experiences, all of it came in one trip. And I got this insight that I am in control and I can heal if I want to. I just need to um, want to do it. And that started this massive journey for me of taking psychedelics, doing therapy and uh, being in a process uh, of untangling the trauma 
Um, on my way there, found out I have complex PTSD. Uh, psychedelics, together with therapy and other practices, again, helps to uh, make sense of that and heal from that to a degree that I'm actually enjoying my life today and it's good. So that's a long story, but my personal experience led me to understand that there are those substances that can, can, can help but also that they're not just the only thing that helps. But if you combine work and psychedelics, then you can be quite successful to get out of trauma and uh, and uh, depression and PTSD or whatever you're suffering, addictions of some people. So I decided to educate about it, um, remove stigma, but also balance the narrative because I feel like recently it's such a popular subject and I think like our duty is to not just sugarcoat them and make them like, yeah, they're going to save the world, but actually show the balanced conversation around benefits and harms that psychedelics can bring to us. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that, Anya. So these are really relevant uh, topics that you touched on, which is also in my own um, area of passion. So. Uh, luckily, lucky for me, I never came into psychedelics uh, through a recreational or even, you know, trying them out as fun uh, in my younger days because I never even knew they existed. So my experience always has been coming from a trauma-informed perspective. Somebody who tried, you know, everything out there like breath work, yoga, like you said earlier, mentioned some of these tools. These are incredible tools, right? They are nothing to to just dismiss or not acknowledge. I think these. I, I've met so many people got to the level of healing uh, where, just because of meditation or something else. And, and for some of us, we just had to try a little bit more intensified tools like psychedelics. So I understand that. That's why it's very difficult for me to comprehend that these are, these are recreational substances. It's like it, there is no part of my brain that functions in that way. So I always see them as healing tools or at least for me um, allies in our um, progressive healing and integration so uh, I really appreciate that I appreciate the fact that you said we need to also educate on the harm reduction this is something hugely in my interest area of interest and I see a lot of uh, mainstream articles are continually sugarcoating and also bombarding us with these uh, panacea level, you know, substances that they can fix everything. So I'm so happy you're on, on this path, teaching and educating. And I do respect what Psychedelic UK Society is doing. Uh, and I'm following you guys on email. So we'll drop all of your links and, and your, we'll share all the information at the end of this conversation so that people can start looking into your content and learn a lot. Because even just following your emails, I see a lot of at least, uh, you know, 70% is, is all about the education and harm reduction, which I love. And uh, yeah, broadening the perspective on these substances. So can we talk about the, the one thing that really stood out for me is you said, um, let's not sugarcoat them. There has to be a work combined with these substances. What are we talking about here when you say the work? Well, so psychedelics opened the door for some. For some people, it was already yoga and meditation, and that got them to psychedelics. But um, I think the therapy, if you can afford it, is actually the best tool with a psychedelic-informed, trauma-informed in integration therapist, ideally. Um, unfortunately, obviously, this is expensive. So um, if you don't have that tool, um, sharing circles are a great um, tool for everyone. Just coming together together, you know, talking about it, contextualizing the insights and trying to ground them somehow together is very useful because as we know, psychedelics also can be very, you know, they can show a lot of very mystical things and you need to ground this because otherwise it gets all wishy-washy a bit. So we need to be careful for that. So community, having a community around you that can support you in this journey, but also obviously still yoga and meditation and any embodiment practices to me, anything that puts you in the body uh, for me dance is the thing and it doesn't have to be a fancy dance where you go do group dancing it could be as simple as playing music and just dancing the feelings out you know whatever puts you in the body so body practices meditation gardening connection with nature 
um, you know, observing nature, understanding you're part of it. I think those would be the most important component components of integration for me in work. Yeah, that's beautiful. So my question would be, how did you come to becoming the co-director of the Psychedelic Society UK? Um, I was asked, you know, I was asked by Stephen Reed, the founder, to join. Um, that was four years ago and they needed a filmmaker on the team. And I was around, I already knew some people from the field and it was still starting. So actually everybody was almost like a friend, you know. Now it's such a big field, but back then it was a small thing. So they just asked me to join and I joined because it was a great opportunity to um, keep spreading the message. Um, and I suppose Psychedelic Society from start of it was a mixture of joining recreational and, and therapy and mental health. And I want to go back to what you say about recreation. If you think about the word recreation, what does it mean? Recreate. So actually, you know, if someone has a severe trauma and PTSD, I would never tell them to try psychedelics on their own in the recreational setting. But if someone is quite neurodivergent and maybe stuck a bit in their life, um, like I was before, and I know many people who also um, had that, and they went to a psychedelic festival and they tried psychedelics, small dose, in a very friendly setting, and they heard the most beautiful music and they saw 2,000 people who are just like them and they connected. And I, I, I've been in that moment. And I must tell you that seeing those people, I felt more healing than from years, hours of therapy sessions, just having the community and feeling part of something. It's so important because we're so disconnected from each other in this world. Mm, I love that. And thank you for touching on that. So <clears throat> the, the UK community is growing. I can see, like you said earlier, so much conversations are happening around psychedelics. And, you know, that's my number one priority to bring people in communities. And I love that you guys are doing this already and you've been doing it so for so long now. And yeah, I have this concept that we need to heal out loud in a community setting. I love that. And, and like you said, sometimes the therapy sessions or the therapeutic approach can be quite, you know, be, you know, um, uncomfortable or maybe intimidating or if, especially if the person is not feeling so safe with the person, the therapist or the facilitator. So I can understand where the, the group or the community aspect comes in and it's more powerful. I see that clearly. And like you said, you know, sometimes I think, um, I think there was a post that uh, caught my eye recently it said, we need to heal from the healing like, you know, this, there is this healing concept that's been thrown around right now that people are so obsessed with. Yeah. And there is this, yeah, I saw an article saying that maybe we don't need to be so harshly into this obsessive healing that we can actually relax and, you know, have these medicines to just guide us without putting too much expectation on. Yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, yeah. I agree hundred percent with you. Um, you know, there are certain things that you can heal. Obviously, if you dissociate from PTSD, yeah, you can heal that. You know, if you can't hold a job and have a, just everything is wrong in your life from depression, yeah, probably you would have to address that too, just like you would address your tooth hurting and stuff. But you are right. There's an obsession of self-growth, healing, almost very narcissistic, being perfect drive. And I am very against that. I think, you know, I'm a neuro neurodivergent person. I have ADHD. And I felt really guilty for years for being that and trying to fit myself into the frames of being this, like, meditated, calm person. But it's 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 complete delusion. And it's never going to happen. And it just makes you miserable. So actually embracing yourself and your little flaws and not seeing them as flaws, but your quakes, I think very, very important. And you have mm -hmm. a... Healing from Healing, great um, Facebook profile run by uh, my friend, Aaron, and uh, some great, great content there. So I really suggest everyone should check it out, Healing from Healing. Just look it it satirically yeah. at, at that phenomenon that we're experiencing now. 
Yeah, you know, I won't be surprised because I couldn't remember the article. Probably it's his article or something or content that came in my way. Yeah, I mean, lately, um, I feel like in the West, when something comes or emerges, we run with it and we kind of like make a mess of it. And, and you know, in the last sort of five years, uh, somatic oh. healing, somatic body you know practices even breath work everybody's a breath work coach now right yeah. and yeah we just kind of go super obsessed into it and and we lose the meaning on the way and yeah suddenly this thing becomes instead of a healing practice it becomes an obsessive narcissistic uh, thing that you know happens in those circles which is quite sad but i love i love that your friend is actually doing the counter of what this is this is about um yeah and also this arriving at the mountaintop in a zen state this is not healing right we know now that this is not healing and i think yeah. you guys are doing an incredible job and I'm, i know your circle a little bit now i've been following some of the people around your circle and and you guys are doing a great job just bringing that education and also this kind of concept to to more mainstream uh just to bring that you know counter the force of like where are we going with this this whole narcissistic ideal uh you know healing processes that everybody's trying to uh, run after so i really appreciate that and the other thing i wanted to touch on is anya your documentary i don't know if you wanted to tell us a bit about that uh you've been filming a documentary yes five years now um that's what documentaries do. You sometimes start. I remember my teacher saying, when you do your documentaries, you will start and think you'll finish in a year and then it will be five years and it will change 10 times. And exactly what he said happened. Um, we started filming five years ago or even longer. And in the beginning, it was this remove the stigma, you know, make psychedelics popular, make everybody know about how great they are. And very quickly it turned into, oh, let's just pause a bit. Let's look at the safety. Let's do it safely. Let's not go get over, uh, go get ahead of ourselves. Um, let's not make the same mistakes as in the 60s and 70s. So um, now it's a beautiful film. It's a journey throughout the last five years of emerging Renaissance, re-emerging Renaissance, and how people who were there five years ago, how they developed today and how we now put a lot of um, focus on integration and preparation and community aspect and actually see the psychedelics not as magic medicine but as just like this little catalyst opening the door one of the tools you can use so yes we're still we finished filming now um, we have a lot of editing done there are some little versions and um little clips circling around the internet. We had screening at Shift Network Festival. We are screening at Boom Festival uh, uh, Boom Festival this year. So, but this is just fragments. So we're crowdfunding um, at the moment to finalize the production, mainly animation that takes loads of money. It's very expensive, but we want to make it really beautiful and uh, compelling. So we're running a crowdfunding campaign if anybody wants to support us. I'm sure we can add a link to it, um, mm -hmm. but also just the psychedelicrenaissance.com is our website and you can reach our um, crowdfunding from there and find out more about the project. Mm, of course, yeah, we'll definitely add it to our show notes. You know, um, years ago when I was coaching at this um, digital company, online company, uh, we used to have these conversations around creating content. And I'm going to relate this to your documentary process. There is there was this saying between us that when you begin a any online project, for example, even a YouTube channel such as this and such as like so many people are online, YouTube, YouTubers, you know, content creators, right? There, yeah, there was a saying between us, among us, that it's not as simple as becoming a content creator or a or growing a YouTube channel. What you are doing is you're growing yourself. You are maturing and it's very interconnected to your own self-growth and I believe this is what you were saying talking about you know you started this documentary five years ago and now looking back 
it's probably directly impacted your own growth if you well, want to say definitely it's you know documentary is very authorship kind of project mm. it's not that um, it's not journalism um and i am one of the characters in the film as well so that journey is documented there but also you know observing the main one of the main main characters is rosalind waltz and uh, she's one of my best friends as well i love this woman um and uh watching her and myself she informed me I informed her we informed each other Michelle Baker Jones as well our very amazing friend so I think it was three of us growing together which was pretty good um, but it was an amazing journey and thanks to all the people I've met I've grown because I had like first-hand experience uh, and you know uh, information from those researchers as it was happening And it was not even published yet in the media and I already was forming decisions. So God, it was a, it was a journey and it was an amazing journey and very important for my own healing and also where I am today, you know, it gave me so much. If I didn't do this documentary, I wouldn't be speaking to you. I wouldn't be working in a psychedelic society. So yeah, great. Creativity is a, is a beautiful thing. Yeah, it's definitely the gateway to the, I believe it's the most powerful self-development process. I believe that putting ourselves out there, there is an incredible like magical process to it that helps us grow more than anything that we could offer to anybody. So I love that how you had the courage to start something like this, a project of documentary, and also willing yourself to be vulnerable enough to grow through the process. That's For me, that's so valuable. Thank you. And, and everyone that took took place in this, you know, everyone that took place or the part in the project. So I was able to join one of your uh, webinars um, just for our listeners, if they're interested. I'm sure some of you guys already know, but I also have audience in the US and some other countries. So in case they don't know, um, you guys do lots of webinars, which is incredible. Bringing lots of, you know, influencers and big voices in the space. So I was able to join one of your webinar and Uh, interestingly, on that webinar, you guys offered pre-screening or some kind of a little screening thing about your documentary. And yeah, we. so I started watching. I'm really hoping that you don't change the end bit. I don't want to say too much because I don't want to give, give away a lot of information because in case our listeners want to check it out. The ending moved me so much that I have made so many radical decisions because of it oh really that's amazing yeah <laughs> is that just to not reveal too much but is that the ending with nikki weird in it uh-huh mm-hmm. okay yeah I, mm-hmm. it makes me cry i saw that at least 50 times it makes me cry every time I hear every that. time every oh. time every time so yeah. i can't wait to own this documentary i'm not saying because i'm talking to you and you're the creator it's just that it was the most authentic touching thing I ever seen oh that's so nice thank you so much and uh like I said um it helped me made some incredible radical decisions going forward I mean that's very rare um and um yeah I just want to say thank you to all of you and I think you know you can see the essence of how you can see it was very easy to 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 follow and grasp everyone's journeys and you did say there are still editing and other changes are happening but it was already perfect for me <laughs> yeah thank you thank you but um i promise it will be better mm. um, your content is so oh it's just gem- gems gems after gems yeah um, but, but please don't touch the ending because that i want <laughs> oh it, it honestly like I, i'm sure our listeners once they get their hands on the the documentary they'll probably agree with me and um yeah so when will it be fully out and ready for the public to own it or buy it or rent it or watch it so by this year this mm-hmm. year i am actually dropping all my events work for the next few months and focusing deeply deeply on the documentary we are missing funds for editing but we're trying to work around it somehow and you know keep crowdfunding and try to look for sponsors but the film will not it will be available for free actually 
That's beautiful. It's, it's a not-for-profit film, so it's going to be on its own website and there will be option for donation if you want to, but you can uh, watch it for free um, because we think that this is what we want to do. It's a, it's made by community because it's made not just by me, it's made by all those people. And actually all the people, the characters in it were so crucial for making of it. I feel like it's our film and it's our gift to others. Uh, you know, just wanted to, I suppose, mention why is it so why there's this atmosphere in it is because those people open their houses their homes their hearts to us it's you know it's a documentary made by the community for the community and it's not some bbc dude with loads of money and cameras who can come and make a movie about magic medicine um it's something different and that's why i think it's very special it is and i I feel like, you know, I've seen, because I'm in the space, I do follow a lot of documentaries before they come out. I'm always signing up for these screenings, you know, pre-screenings. And I see, I have seen tons and tons of documentaries with uh, psychedelic, around psychedelic medicines. And usually they are involving a lot of indigenous native, uh, you know, teachings, or at least someone's journey into the jungle or someone you know, connecting with the, the roots of, you know, a very native sort of tradition. So for me, this is going to be, for me, your documentary addresses the missing piece that, yes, we are, we all love and respect and thank you to all of the indigenous and the, the native people that carried this wisdom and the traditions and the, the, the right way of doing the medicines, you know, the working psychedelic medicines. But yet we all live in the West with challenging lives, jobs, nine to five jobs, challenging relationships, challenging mental health issues. And I thought when you watch those kind of documentaries, it kind of takes you and, you know, sweeps your feet off the floor and you're like, you're in the jungle experiencing all of this and it takes you to another world, but then you're back into your own Western life and you have to wake up for work tomorrow morning. You know, all of the challenges, they never go away. Somehow your documentary addresses that realness of the real people in the Western world and really also um, approaching the therapeutic approaches of the medicines. It was just so timely and it was just, it's going to address a lot of the struggles and it's going to also support, yes, there is the indigenous and the native and the traditional way of learning the plant work, but hey, also we have this model. And I think, I think um, you know, a lot of people say to me, what do you see that's going to come up with all this crazy psychedelic mainstream popularity, popularism? I'm always thinking like, I know we're definitely going to need to create new models, yeah. new modality that actually can fit in the Western world into the, the industrialized lives that we have. And that's why I love what you are doing and Dr. What's doing and everyone else that took part in this documentary doing is addressing exactly that. Thank so you I, for trying. <laughs> I feel like it's going to change a lot of conversations around psychedelics. I feel like it's going to definitely um, become a benchmark somehow. I know I'm saying a lot of positive stuff here. It's because my experience with it, um, I connected it also coming from a holistic psychotherapy background and, and coming into the world of psychedelics through the therapeutic lenses, uh, for me, it was that valuable. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. You're welcome. So we'll put the links in and then hopefully uh, everybody can also subscribe somehow and uh, and support your, your mission. And so how did you become a filmmaker? I know this journey started with you being the filmmaker and and, you know, there is a saying in the psychedelic space with my own community as well, that once you kind of get involved with psychedelic medicines, synchronicities are crazy amplified. And um, somehow things just appear, people just turn up, opportunities, conditions just change and make things possible that you couldn't even think it was going to be possible. So I just want to touch on that. Um, even I feel like you probably met the right people, right opportunities came in your way and started this documentary. I'm sure it's, it's been really difficult because I remember you said on the webinar so many times you wanted to give up. I'm glad you didn't. And uh, so how did you become a filmmaker and how, how did it all come together? 
as a last piece? Yeah, I've always been uh, into art. Uh, you know, I'm uh, my dad a uh, photographer, my mom a painter, my sister a painter and a graphic designer. Um, I've studied multimedia. It was always there. And uh, I've done photography for a bit and then digital media production. And then I really wanted to do master's degree and I thought, which media do I like the most? And film is the most versatile. Um, I am not patient enough with animation, to be honest. <laughs> So also always wanted to tell people's stories because I um, always thought that film has this magic that you can change things. You know, when you have um, re- loads of research about something and politicians don't care but or, or the public doesn't care, but then they hear one good story of healing with cannabis, let's say, and suddenly all public changes their mind and suddenly laws are being changed, you know. So sometimes it takes one good story to change the world. Not the world, but change some issue. So that's why I became a filmmaker. I studied it and uh, I studied documentary filmmaking. Uh, and with synchronicities, not sure if they're synchronicities or are you just better at picking those things up and seeing them and going for them and more determined, one or either. But once I made the decision, yeah, there was a lot of help. I immediately have got help from Natalie Ginsberg from Ups and Eva Cesarova from the Czech Republic, and Darren, and everybody just sent me to another person. And maybe because I was one of the first people doing it, and there was not many films, everybody's like, yeah, we need to say this story. So there was just loads of support. And the moments when I almost gave up was because constant lack of money, I keep putting my own, you know, I don't earn a lot, but I keep putting my own money in the bin, which means then I need to like, eat much less or don't go out at all, you know, so there's sacrifices. And sometimes I feel like, I just want to go on holidays and drop all of this and not spend all this money. But all in all, it's worth it. And every time my team just told me off and said, no, we need to keep going. It's important, Anya, we need to keep going. So we keep going. That's amazing. And yeah, well done. Congratulations for keep going. So I just wanted to also get your insights and your thoughts around what do you see happening right now globally around psychedelics? Dark things, unfortunately. Um, There's some hope as well, but mainstreaming is overwhelming. Um, I see loads of and loads of money flowing in and very little money being funneled out for accessibility, reciprocity i see you know conferences with people who never took psychedelics but they're flowing there in their expensive suits with their uh, pounds and dollars trying to invest and trying to make a quick fix so things like oh how we can change ayahuasca so people don't vomit and make it a bit more palatable for western crowd you know all, all those little things are quite disturbing the patenting, the, the, the rat race for the money, this is very disturbing. Uh, lack of accessibility, a ketamine clinic in UK, I think it's five or 7,000 pounds to have the, the session. It's just absurd with money. The lack of diversity keeps being just outrageous in the UK, especially. Uh, we keep seeing a lot of white guys, mostly. There's some women, fortunately very few people with black community, very few people from any other ethnic, uh, you know, background, very disturbing. Uh, There's very few funding opportunities for people to set up their own things, you know, for people who are not rich already and, and medical. So I see that and it's quite scary. But the good thing though that I'm seeing, there is this movement of psychedelic therapists mostly in the UK, who are standing up to this and saying, it's not about the drug, it's about the community aspect. And there's a lot of community efforts. So you have Saipan, Leonie Schneider and Ian Rullier, two former patients from Imperial College Psilodep, um, Psilocybin for Depression study. They now set up Saipan and this is like a network of uh, psychedelic patients. So they're doing great work there. Um, Rosalind Waltz set up Acer Integration, 
which is all about integrating psychedelics and not only just also healing from depression, whatever, as a community with nature, following um, us, uh, fo- sorry, fo- following Celtic tradition of trees, you know, and which each what each tree represents. So there are those community grassroots movements, and this is this is very very um, hopeful and fascinating, exciting for me. Mm, that's beautiful. So what do you think about? Um, because I heard, for example, Maps Canada, uh, Rick Doblin found he says uh, if it's going to take this much darkness to get them out there to the people that need it let it be along those lines i'm just re- re- uh, yeah i know that rhetoric yeah yeah so what are your thoughts on that yeah brilliant bring the bring the money and we can bring all those people but they need to just reciprocity they immediately should open bursaries for people to be able to access and and you know no i don't think we should sacrifice everything to just get them out there because when they're out there and there's no support for people and no community no integration then they're going to slip back into depression month later so people will make money but you're not going to be better off you're going to still be depressed you're just going to have a month of depression um and also you might not even be able to access it because it will be too expensive so how is it good for everyone i can't actually see if they have so much money now to invest, because we see millions flowing into it, it was just like they were meeting in Davos, Switzerland, just what now, and talking, you know, about psychedelics and, and money and stuff. So if we already have that much money, we already can create those programs. So I just want to see them. And until I see them, I'm not going to be impressed, to be honest, mm-hmm. with what they're doing. Okay, okay. So... um psychedelics as a non-specific amplifier. So I am agreeing with you on here where you said, unless there is a community, unless there is some guidance, some support, and the person is willing and ready, because, you know, one of the things that continually emerges for us uh, within my community is that people read something on the paper or the mainstream or social media about some, you know, panacea medicine, and they want to try it and be okay tomorrow morning. They want to, you know, that, you know, goal of yeah. re- reaching the top of the mountain on a Zen state. And then, <laughs> and then when they, especially when I speak with them, no, that's not the case. That is not true. I actually get challenged uh, that, uh, that I am negatively uh, promoting them. It says not that I'm negatively, it's just being realistic that firstly, um, one of my favorite things is um, they say to me, what, what, do, what is required in order for me to get some healing or some transformative benefits from, um, these medicines I'm always like it's not that you you can try it anywhere it's not like they're happening everywhere it's not like you can't access them you can but the real healing or the real transformation comes with when you are willing to let go of all those things in your life that hasn't served you for years it's not that you can't change you can but are you willing to let go of those things that didn't serve you and you know, all, all these challenges that you are creating in your life. So people don't want to change anything, but just want to take this medicine while still sitting in toxicity. They just want to keep taking the medicine. And I always see that as a bypass. It's the quickest way to bypass. And you know this. That's why the psychedelics, I think, lends themselves to this bypassing. Oh, yeah. Um, and these narratives, the mystical. So the mystical can be quite quite detrimental in someone's healing because I always see that as these stories wrapped around the mystical just to get away from their physical pain or or challenges you know so yeah there's a lot here that needs to be done and said and spoken of Um, I'm glad that you guys are you know holding this this stance because um I think I think Rick Doblin said again you know let this all come crashing down and then we rebuild something from the ashes but I don't know how how good use is this but um i think it's more about for me it's more about educating the person what what it entails to transform and heal first place before you take anything in your body right yeah i I think like this let's call it burn down and build it out this old masculine like let's just you know shiva it out and start the new why can we not go gentle feminine you know step by step let's build it 
from the ground level together and we don't have to rush. Uh, we really don't have to rush because if we do, it's going to end up much worse, I think. And also, you know, I know Rick was there for ages and I have so much respect for him. But actually, there's so much controversy around maps recently and their results and uh, the, their procedures that makes me think, really, we cannot do this way. We need to prioritize safety of people. Um, because otherwise, as you know, people get re-traumatized and all kinds of new problems start uh, from it. So that's, mm -hmm. that's also very important. Mm -hmm. Great. Brilliant. So I know that um, Dr. Watts launched the integration programs recently, which is amazing. Um, hopefully look forward to speaking to her at some point. And so what are you guys um, planning to, to, how will you tackle with this or will you just observe and how, what, what, how do you see your role in this space of what, what can you bring or can you is there any projects going on what can we do to even help and support you guys laying down these foundations to, to safety and harm reduction um yeah it's uh we in the beginning we were like oh should we fight should we do something you know but then we quickly realized this is too big we can't change this this is just gonna have to play out obviously but we have to do our own so we're just gonna keep doing our work and educating and bringing community and for years we've been getting people joining our community people who went to trials and after the psilocybin trials or whatever trial they were into they felt very bewildered and lonely and didn't know what to do with their lives and we were catching them as they were falling and we were trying to get them connected with community and practices that they can use to keep going without psychedelics. So we'll just keep doing that because there are going to be more and more people like this. Mm -hmm. And we're just going to make sure that our spaces to integrate and, um, and prepare. And uh, how people can support us is by becoming members of the Psychedelic Society. I, we have, I think, 900 members now. Uh, who donate monthly um, to uh, money to us. And what we do with this money, we make uh, reduction resources. We run important events that normally wouldn't you know, pay for themselves because event production is so expensive. We make educational videos, campaigns on social media. So becoming members is the most important for us. And uh, yeah, don't hate to our documentary because that documentary is going to help a lot um, already in that cause. Mm, that's brilliant. Yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you. And I know we're coming to the end of our conversation, but I want to pick your brain, as they say, for one more thing. Uh, who's someone in, in the field for such a long time, you've probably seen all kinds of things happening. And what are your thoughts on this phenomena of people just drinking one time ayahuasca and then start serving it? Oh, I'm, the, un the underground world, let's say. I yeah, very, I'm very bad about it. Yeah, it's something that I'm very against. I see it a lot. I see a lot of people becoming shamans because ayahuasca told them, or whether it's one experience or five experiences, uh, you're not ready. Uh, people have, not you, obviously, person, you know, uh, people have psychotic attacks sometimes on psychedelics if you don't know how to deal with that shouldn't probably run those things. It's not as easy as sitting a friend or taking psychedelics in a group. It's a big responsibility. And unfortunately, I see more and more shamans like this coming up. And I think this is unfortunately another wave of this narcissistic wave of, yeah, we are goddesses, we are shamans, you know, put the feathers uh, and white clothing and it looks really beautiful and everybody's a goddess but this is very unhealthy for everyone and it can potentially be dangerous. I mean, it is dangerous to many, many people, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lately I have been, obviously because of my research work, I do follow a lot of the stuff and you probably guys, you know, you know the same, you know the work. Um, so I've been coming across more lately about people who's been, uh, pinned down in even in in the natives like in native countries you know in, in native uh, traditional way of serving the medicine uh the most disturbing one was very recently actually last week i read that somebody documented their experience a friend had a psychotic breakdown 
and the native uh, facilitators they didn't speak any English. This happened in in uh, is it Costa? Is it Peru? I think it was Peru. And um, and then all they all they did was to jump on him and pin him down like three four um, native facilitators, and they couldn't speak English, and they just kind of pinned them down uh, until the experience kind of wore off. Um, so for me, like I, I remember, I remember doing my foundation work with a native uh, medicine facilitator, and and we used to have these deep conversations with her because she used to travel, of course, and also she used to facilitate for a lot of Western people. And one thing she said to me that she observed very much is that because they grow up in a country where they are very embodied. Um, when they lose, you know, death and rebirth and childbirth and festivals, they're very embodied communities where they live their grief and joy on their sleeve. Yeah. So, so therefore, when they drink ayahuasca, they don't have inhibitions. Therefore, each time they release something, they dance it out, move it out, scream it out, sing it out, shake it out, you know? Yeah. So, but she she realized in the West, she said, I always ask her, like, what is your number one challenge serving medicine to the Western people? And she always said, they suppress so much that every time we hold this medicine circle, she always like gets ready with her team, be ready because when the medicine cracks somebody open, the years and years of suppression inhibition will act out in a psychotic episode and that she says we have to be ready for that that's why a lot of the native medicine facilitators are not familiar with working with the western psyche that's why i said to you that's why i was so in awe that you guys covered so much of the therapeutic aspect and so much of the mental health and so much of the western programming the conditioning in your documentary which i love and i think this is the missing piece for me. That's why people get inspired and excited. They travel to Peru and they sit in circles where the facilitators, they don't understand our culture. They don't know how much we're suppressing and how much we're holding inside. And when somebody breaks open and have a psychotic experience, they don't know what to do with them, right? So, but like you said, um, just because the biotech companies are now coming in and making this all popular and famous and trendy, I see also the underground facilitators just popping up everywhere, calling themselves shamans, like you said. Is there anything you guys, do you have conversations around? Is there anything we could talk and say to, to it? Or what are your thoughts on that? Well, just so people need to be very careful how they choose the facilitator, I think. I, in general, would not encourage anyone to actually go to jungle and do ayahuasca. Um, because, as you said, uh, but also because it's actually not great for environment and it would be much easier to just take something that is more growing in your land. Mushrooms grow everywhere. You know, you can find them in Wales growing in, uh, you know, on, on the field. Um, they've been there forever. So they're more ours, I believe, you know, and better for environment, easier. And, uh, oh, but also when you do travels and the Netherlands, which it's legal there, um, be careful how you choose the facilitator too. So should be recommended by someone you really trust, but still check them. Google search obviously about them if you cannot find something bad about them because there's a lot of accounts of bad practice uh, already. What I would uh, say, have a conversation with them on Zoom at least before you actually decide to go travel and do the weekend because once you're there, you might feel like, oh, it's too late. So just make your research before you go. Uh, you know, as much as possible, um, we always have, we will have soon a page with recommended retreats that we know are good. Uh, we currently identify three that we're very happy to, to recommend. We know the people, we've been to their retreats, we've tested it. Um, we have some one-to-one and session facilitators we can recommend if somebody wants until this is on our website people can get in touch with me and just email me and I can forward those two people um so I think this is very important and the other very important thing is that we need to create more resources 
to catch the people who went to those bad retreats and have more integration circles, harm reduction. So who, if someone for some reason went to things like that, there's a beautiful resource called Fire uh, Site right now. And they uh, not only have a one-to-one -one, um, like phone line that you can call, come and talk, but I also have a lot of resources how to, you know, um, what to do later when it happens to you and come to integration circles because I've been running them for two years now and I really see how many people come with bad experiences and how much better than feel just after talking about it to others. So, um, yeah, I think that's all we can do for now. Yeah, and that's that's enough. That's enough because the, that's the, for me that's the therapeutic model, and that's how I know that people receive the best benefits when they start having these conversations. And I also see that there's a lot of like misinformation around. Oh, it's a bad trip, but but we're looking for a bad trip. I think they miss the. There is a fine line between you know, in you know thinking that bad trip is good, but then when that person's actually seriously being re-traumatized. So if the facility is not attuned to this kind of therapeutic model, obviously they, they cannot tell if this is really, really bad trip that needs intervention or is it, should we just leave the person to just go through the bad trip? So there's a lot of nuances, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure you're in this every day of these conversations, but um, yeah, so... Again, I just want to say I'm also hopeful. I'm sure we're going to emerge with um, new modalities and harm reduction uh, resources. So thank you so much, Anya. This has been really amazing to talk to you. Thank you. It was great to chat. Good to have uh, allies on the same side. So thank you so much for doing your work as well. Oh, absolutely. Appreciate you guys. And just the last sort of wisdom of words just want to share something with our listeners if there's anything you want to share projects you want to uh, ask for support please go ahead and then I'm sure we'll add more into the show notes as well just stay stay safe guys that's I always say that stay safe um, mm -hmm. because it's not just walk in the park it's much more profound and difficult than that and complex and uh, and help us spread the knowledge so support us we are grassroots, not for profit. We're all um, just normal people in our bedrooms and <laughs> little flats. And any support helps us to do really big things. So a uh, massive thank you to, to, for anyone who supported already. And uh, yeah, keep being on our side. It really helps us to keep going. That's beautiful. Okay, great. Thanks, Anya. That's wonderful. Thank you everybody for joining us. Hope you guys enjoyed this conversation. Please do reach out to me or Anya. You can email Anya. We'll put all the links and the information below. And do share and comment. We need to, we need more engagement. We need to know your thoughts, what you share, your experiences. Don't hold back. And I'll see you guys on the next one. Bye for now. Much love. Bye. Thank you so much for joining us. Psychedelic Conversations podcast is designed to educate, inform and expand awareness. For more information, please head over to psychedelicconversations.com. You can also share with your friends or leave a review so that we can reach more people. You can also join us in our private Facebook group to keep the conversation going. This show is for information purposes only and it is not intended to provide mental health or medical advice. Thanks for listening.